Well, y'all, uh, thank you for coming. I thank all of you for coming and for working so hard to get this law passed. This, this really is a great day for South Carolina. This is something that has been coming for a long time. It often takes a long time to, to get things done, but is is that the health of our people has become more and more of an issue and we realize how important it is and, and we realize how easy it is to stay healthy if you just know what to do and you have access to someone that can help you. We don't all have time to, to learn all what we ought to be doing to, to keep our body and mind together. But with the access to health care, particularly in the rural areas, that is inexpensive, that is available as close to 24 hours a day as we can make it, uh, we can make our people more and more healthy and with good health come a lot of other good things this uh it is this this is a great beginning and i, I want to tell the the senators and uh house member judge clary i look forward to the day that we have total uh, telemedicine in yes, the sir. state where all the all the people on the cell phone can have access to medical care, good medical guidance, health care. So with that, uh, I know there are a lot of people here responsible for this bill, which is a major step forward. It's probably the, the biggest step forward we've made in a number of years in this area. I'd like to call on those responsible, starting with Senator Tom Davis. Senator. Thank you, Governor. And as the Governor said, this is a huge step forward for health care in South Carolina. And to give you an idea of the scale, you've got about 3,500 primary care physicians in South Carolina. What we're talking about today is empowering 3,600 uh, nurses and nurse practitioners to render health care service. And so this is a situation where everybody wins. And I, I want to call attention to a couple people. Um, Wanda Crotwell and Amanda Mitchell, um, who lobbied on behalf of the nurses, did a great job. Ben Holmeyer did a fantastic job representing the South Carolina Medical Association and finding the common ground, working collaboratively. Uh, and then most importantly, quite frankly, and I, I mean this in all sincerity, I've been working on this for five or six years. The difference this year and the reason that this bill got passed and we're here today is because this man right here to my left, Governor McMaster, stood out there in that lobby in March and said, this is a priority. We need to increase the access to health care. We need to get nurses into the rural communities. And the day after, or actually the afternoon after, Governor McMaster had that press conference, the bill got passed out of subcommittee, the wind was in its sails, and it went through the Senate and went to the House, and Judge Clary took it over from there. So this is an instance where a lot of people did a lot of hard work and it all came together, from Stephanie Burgess on behalf of the nurses, to Wanda Crotwell and Ben Holmeyer on behalf of the stakeholders, uh, to Governor McMaster putting wind in the sails and Judge Clary in the House, and it got done. This is the way things are supposed to work. There are no losers today, only winners, the people of South Carolina. And with that, I'll turn to my right and introduce uh, Judge Clary, who got this thing through the House. Thank you, Judge. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator Davis. Uh, you know, when I was elected four years ago, I had a group of advanced practice registered nurses at Clemson University to contact me and wanted to meet with me. And this was their priority then. And this is the first bill that I signed on to as a member of the South Carolina House. Four years later, we see the re result of collaboration uh, between the House and the Senate, the medical community, uh, just a, any number of stakeholders. And I agree with Senator Davis. Uh, when our friend, my friend Henry McMaster got involved, that took it to a different level. And, you know, this is a Senate bill. And I think that it's really important for us to understand that Senator Davis and I introduced these bills at the same time, mine in the House, his in the Senate. But I can tell you this, there is no pride in authorship when it comes to getting things done for the people of South Carolina. And this is truly a signal day in our state. And with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Stephanie Davis. Burgess. Uh, Burgess, Burgess, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got another friend named Stephanie Davis. I, I claim her, though. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. I have to put on my glasses. These guys don't wear any. I'm not sure why. But anyways, <laughs> no offense. Um, big day for patients, big day for patient care access. And I just want to personally acknowledge on behalf of the coalition, Governor McMaster, Senator Davis and Representative Clary. We want to acknowledge all of our physician partners, the Medical Association, the Academy of Family Practice, 
I want to acknowledge our coalition members, our business partners who are here. I want to acknowledge our colleges are here who have supported us. And I want to acknowledge the hospital association. I think they're here as well and the South Carolina nurses. So it's a big day. Everybody came together, to make this happen. And I really want to applaud these three gentlemen for their efforts because they really sailed that bill through the House and the Senate. And it was a great day for South Carolina when it passed. So thank you so much. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think the most immediate thing is that it removes the 45 mile radius requirement. I mean, under the old law, uh, nurse practitioners or nurses in general could not render care outside of a 45 mile radius of where a supervising physician was located. And uh, many physicians locate in urban areas. It's just uh, a fact. A lot of them li live in urban areas. And so that means when you start drawing that 45 mile radius, uh, nurse practitioners and other nurses can't get into the rural areas. Um, so the first thing that this law does is it removes that 45 mile uh, radius. What it also does is it allows physicians and nurses to work collaboratively. It allows them to enter into written practice agreements so that if you have a, a supervising physician and you have a nurse practitioner who work well together and there's a high degree of confidence there, uh, the doctor and the nurse can enter into a written agreement that expands the scope of the services to be provided. So it really allows individuals who have experience and have built in trust, up trust over the years, you know, to have that, that experience and, and have that translated into healthcare delivery. So, um, you know, again, the, the numbers tell the story. You've got 3,600 um, nurses and you've got 3,500 primary care physicians. You look at enrollment levels and nursing schools, it's exploding. Uh, this is all about increasing the number of providers, and I think this is a great step in that direction. Is there a correlation between the rural areas and the older population, would you say? Um, I don't know about a correlation between rural areas and older population, but I do know that looking at areas that are underserved, it's very clear that the rural areas um, don't have the access to health care services that those in the urban area does. And I think it's important to understand that. We, we tend in health care sometimes to talk about insurance and making somebody have an insurance policy or having them on Medicaid, but that doesn't really mean a whole lot if there aren't caregivers in the area to actually deliver the care. So, so this addresses that aspect of it. I'm not saying insurance isn't important. I'm not saying that Medicaid isn't valuable. What I am saying is it doesn't answer the question of who's going to provide that care. And so this opens the door for a lot of health care services that previously were closed. Sure. So what will happen is this will expand the scope of practice for nurse practitioners and nurse midwives to reach out to rural and underserved communities or go to those um, vulnerable populations like the elderly you just mentioned to set up a primary care office to work collaboratively with a physician who may or may not be on site. We can um, order physical therapy. We can send a patient to a physical therapist. We can um, maybe expand our prescribing rights. So for example, I have a practice. We see a lot of foster care children and they tend to move around the state because of that's the way the foster care system works. But we will be able to manage those patients via telehealth so that if we have patients in Charleston or Oconee, they don't have to travel to Columbia for care. We can do a telehealth visit that way. We may be able to prescribe their Ritalin or Adderall. In that manner, of course, we have to go before the boards to request to be able to do that. So that'll be one way we can increase access. We can also um, reach out to populations for hospice, palliative care, and those are our growing populations as well, and we'll be able to provide services for them. So it'll be a day-to-day increase access to care. Patients can come to us for handicap placards if they need that, if they've had an orthopedic injury. Um, so we hope to reach out in that manner. Does that make sense? Okay. It makes you. good sense. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even without glasses, he says it makes good sense. More questions? <laughs> <laughs>
does this take effect immediately or is there, is there a start date? August 1st. July 1st. July 1st. July 1st. Sorry. Yeah, it's already a fit. I'm just in a lag zone. What can I say? <laughs> Any more? So for the governor, uh, there's been a lot of telehealth programs that have been funded through the legislature. Why is that a priority for you? What I want to do, as everyone here wants to do, is see to it that all the people in the state have access to, to health care, to health instructions, to information, to health to advice. And people often can't travel. People don't have automobiles, or they don't have time, or they have children they can't leave, or jobs they can't leave. And so we have to take it to them, because they, they can't come to the city, they often can't go to the doctor's office, and maybe can't even make to see the nurse. But if they can get on that telephone in some way, uh, as I did one time, I had a had a little spot on my, my eyelid, and I was riding in the car going somewhere. I called my eye doctor, my glasses doctor, said, I got a spot on the eyelid. He said, well, show it to me. So I did. <laughs> and he said, you need some ABC goo. Call, call, I'll call you the pharmacy See? and go pick it up. There you go. There you go. That's telemedicine. And you charge me <laughs> but anyway, that's that, that's the kind of that, that's where we're all going. It's, it's, it's individual, direct, individual service and, and attention. And this bill, really, as these gentlemen and ladies have said, just opens the door wide and, and unleashes the power that we have with with the nurse practitioners to 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 do that work and carry it all over the state, unrestricted. Thank you. It's great. We appreciate it. And, and the beautiful thing about it is that. All 46 counties have underserved areas. That's right. So this is something that truly affects our entire state. That's right. On that topic, how are you addressing broadband issues throughout the rural parts of the state that have a hard time connecting? The, the companies are working on that night and day, trying to figure out a way to get it everywhere, and we with them. We follow that. Following up on that, what are the challenges the state faces actually putting these type of health care facilities in those rural areas? I mean, you mentioned you have a long-time hospital. Well, see, that's, yeah, that's the thing. We, the question is, do we really need a facility? Or this, this step, this is inexpensive. It doesn't require a great investment of money. It just, it opens, it, it unshackles the power of one great aspect of our health care system. That is, these nurses who are available to render, give the advice and render the services that, that, that the people need. I know it's for the 45 mile radius, but what about, for instance, if you go into an area where there is not, I guess, a clinic or somewhere for that nurse practitioner to come in and see the patient? Well, that's th those are the kind of things that we need to uh, to address. Yeah. But but the, the, the first step is is to have that nurse practitioner able or eligible, uh, empowered to be in that area. Right, and if you empower supply like that, if you give nurse practitioners the ability to render the care they're trained to provide, I mean the market's going to respond to that. And nurses are going to come together and form a business. They're going to have capital. They're going to have people coming there. I mean, what we're doing here, what government should be about, is unleashing the potential of people, letting them do what they're trained to do and things actually in this country will take care of themselves if you let people you know achieve and and render the services they're trained to provide those things tend to take care of themselves we don't need to have the government out there micromanaging where a clinic's going to be you'll see supply meet demand and this is about empowering supply see the law before this was that you had i think is one physician to supervise no more than three nurses Correct. within a 45 mile limit well, that, that may have been a good idea when it was enacted, whenever that was, but it, it's not a good idea now. So now we have removed those limitations, and that empowers, as Senator Davis says, that, em that empowers this, this whole part of our society. Thank you for coming. Come back Thank and see you. Thank you. Good job, Doug.